on this edition of Native Report. We visit the beautiful land of Frog Bay Tribal National Park. We meet artist Greg Robinson of the Chinook Indian Nation. And we interview Judy Goshkabas, Executive the Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian, Indian Affairs. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Frog Bay Tribal National Park is an incredible area with primordial forest and pristine sandy beaches on the southern shore of Lake Superior. It is an area historically important to the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. As waves off of Lake Superior gently break onto the sandy beach of Frog Bay Tribal National Park, a gathering officially opened Wisconsin's newest outdoor recreation area. Growing up, there's a lot of places to, you know, this is just one area that's like this. Uh, we have, like, the, a lot of the reservation is still undeveloped. Uh, in, in growing up, to actually be out there in the woods, hunting, fishing, you know, doing different things, and now I can pass it down to my, my son. You know, other families can do the same thing. I'm honored, you know, to actually be here. To reclaim a piece of land, to protect and preserve that uh, for, for, for the next millennium, I think it's, it's wonderful that all our minds in and the use of this land all seem to mesh together and, and, and our thoughts as well as the council and the uh, natural resource divisions, as well as the uh, wishes of the uh, owner and the conservancy group that uh, as stewards we will maintain it in, in, in a spiritual and cultural way. It is through a collaborative effort by the band, the Bayfield Regional Conservancy, and previous owners David and Marjorie Johnson that made the park a reality, the first of its kind in the United States. It wasn't too lengthy of a process, but long enough. Um, the Johnson family that owned this property, um, he didn't want to give it up to anybody else, uh, non-members, because he felt that it, it was to the tribes in the beginning. Uh, he never wanted to develop it, and he approached the, uh, the Bayfield Regional Conservancy, and then they intended to uh, come and approach the tribe, and it just happened to work out. This wouldn't have been possible if we did not have that relationship with the Conservancy. Um, Red Cliff is a real, real poor, poor community, and we just didn't have the, the means to uh, write the grants and get the funds that uh, we ended up being able to purchase this property. It was a dream come true. Yeah, you could just look out, span out, you could see the islands, this pristine, this pristine area. Um, some plans for this park, we uh, want to have a little over two miles of uh, natural trail. We'll have a little comfort station up at uh, in the parking lot um, and a lot of education uh, on our medicinal plants. Um, just what uh, us as Native people used uh, throughout history. We hope to be able to 
uh, have a identifying uh, mark on each tree to give their biological name, the common name, and then the Ojibwe name with a little story on what the use was for, for the tribal people at that time. And, and I, it's a wonderful place to for education tool. And I think uh, uh, that, that's one of the benefits that I see that can occur here. With a day celebration over, the quiet of the forest was broken by the occasional hiker along the trail. And that is how Red Cliff tribal officials envisioned it. This is the first tribally owned, tribally, uh, like a, other, other tribes manage parks that are within their reservation that's tied to National Park Service. But this is uh, Red Cliff's very own. It's uh, demonstrating our, our sovereignty. We are, we are a sovereign nation here in Red Cliff. And this is, uh, this is a pretty big deal uh, to actually say we have a national park here on, you know, pretty much the most northern tip of Wisconsin. Now, our whole tribal community, uh, other tribal members, non-members can come and uh, walk on this uh, pristine beach, walk in this old forest, uh, gather medicines, hunt, come down here and fish. I mean, that means the world. I mean, that's, that's just our life. Walking down the trail, you know, and seeing that lake for the first time is just like our ancestors seen it a long time ago too. We're, we're seeing what they see. It's a wonderful place to live. You know, and our ancestors, they, they came here, you know, we were placed here, creator put us here. And we're just, you know, living this, you know, living the dream that they had. Did you know that the United States signed nearly 400 treaties with Indian tribes? Most tribes in the lower 48 states have at least one treaty with the United States. However, not a single California tribe has a treaty with the U.S. government. Many California tribes signed treaties with the U.S. and gave up vast land holdings. However, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the California treaties, and thus they are legally not enforceable. In 1871, treaty making with Indian tribes ended, but existing treaties were supposed to continue to be the supreme law of the land. As we know, most Indian treaties have been broken, such as the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which guaranteed Indian tribes their sacred Black Hills. But it should be noted that in 1905, the U.S. Supreme Court said that an Indian treaty should not be viewed as a grant of rights to the Indians, but rather as a grant of rights from them. Next, as a child, artist Greg Robinson received a gift, a small wooden canoe that sparked his interest in traditional Chinookan art forms. Today, his pieces of art pay tribute to his Columbia River ancestors, to whom life, art, stories, and culture were inseparable. As an eagle flies over the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge, artist Greg Robinson works in the quiet solitude of a plank house, a traditional structure of the Chinook Nation. I carve pretty much strictly in the Columbia River art style. Um, using traditional uh, examples of uh, existing artifacts as guides to kind of steer me in the right direction. In my mind, it's a very unique art form, very distinguishable from um, Coast Salish, which this art form is constantly being kind of clustered into that Coast Salish uh, category. But I, I believe it's a distinct art style. Um, you can easily tell on 90% of the pieces what's comes off the Columbia River versus what comes out of Puget Sound or 
you know, further up the coast. So it's a unique style and I, I try to stay pretty traditional on what I do. There's a series of what I call identifiers that kind of help you identify what's Columbia River versus the more Coast Salish. And some of those basic rules are, are a lot of geometric shaping and I don't know if you can see the detail here, but just simple geometric slash lines. Um, you see this exposed ribs very often in this art. Um, and that's not strictly something on the Columbia River, you see that elsewhere, but you usually will see that exposed rib in a combination with a, number, a numerical reference of five and sometimes three, but five is a very, very important number to our culture, so it's often represented in both our art and in the stories. And so you'll see uh, a constant repetition of that, that numerical rule uh, show up in the artwork. Another, probably the next most prominent feature on, on these human faces are the, the exposed, or the prominent eyebrow ridge and the prominent nose, which are often represent the highest part of a face carving. That's the highest uh, plane. Greg is also a stone carver and has done several large outdoor installations. It is relatively recent when he started carving in the traditional style. I've always had kind of an inclination to, to be artistic. Um, probably in the last decade that I really focused on specifically Columbia River themed uh, carvings. And uh, again, specifically in stone, mostly basalt and, uh, and cedar is the primary wood that I carve in, both red and yellow cedar. It's my way of connecting back. And I always feel like once you put a knife to a piece of wood or um, start that first line on a drum or a, a painting that you entered into a sort of agreement. You know, you've crossed a threshold where now you, you're responsible for how that piece turns out. So it's important to me to um, both connect to my culture, but also to you know, properly respect such an important piece of wood as red cedar, which is a very highly regarded uh, tree in our, in our culture, a high status tree. Currently, Greg's preparing several pieces for a group exhibit at a Portland art gallery. There are so many different types of artists. I guess I'll just talk from the artist standpoint, from, the, from how they are personally. And they have various reasons why they create what they create. And the beauty about Greg is that he really cares about his culture and his culture's art. And it shows in the work by the time that he takes with it. It's not produced necessarily for just commercial gain, which I love. He really cares about it. He learns about the history of it, the tradition of a rattle, say, or a comb, how it was made um, in the early times, and then translates that into contemporary carving. And then the time he takes technically with the pieces, every single piece is so beautifully done, meticulously done. So it doesn't just stop with the artwork in a gallery. It's in his life. This is what he does. He is teaching and um, teaching people about his culture, teaching his own people about their own culture. So it's a, a beautiful revitalization because of what he's doing. There wasn't any question that we wouldn't have him in the gallery, and I'm so thrilled to honor, honor his tradition by having his work here. Well, this is a, a panel, and I've put red cedar and yellow cedar together because I feel, you know, being brother and sister, that they don't oftentimes get to spend a lot of time together. They kind of grow in different regions, and I always have kind of liked the concept of putting them together in a piece. And it shows the moon as the main figure here in human form. And above are frogs. And there was a period of time where frog had control of the moon, kept the moon in its mouth. So the nights were very, very dark. And the people would oftentimes misbehave at night because they knew they couldn't be seen. So the, the frog used to take a great, get a great bit of humor out of pulling the moon out and shining it down on people and embarrassing them. And then these snakes on the side represent uh, lightning snakes. It's just a component of the sky. And you see a lot of the, the motifs that identify Chinook and art, uh, the triangle 
pattern which raises a zigzag in between it. If you don't look at the triangles, you see a raised pattern of a zigzag, a very prominent feature of Chinook and art. These belts with geometric lines, kneecaps that are raised with geometric lines, the exposed ribs, which are a very common element. Again, the heavy eye ridge with the nose being a, a high point, um, and then a somewhat of a headdress, a little less of a headdress on this one, but these side pieces representing fur hat, fur, the old fur style hats that hung down uh, with shell uh, decorations. The culture, basically, in general, is my inspiration, but the stories, our old stories, are constantly kind of those fertile grounds that I go back to to reference art, uh, to give a theme to a piece of art. Um, but generally, it's just something that I feel pays uh, proper respect to the culture and to those people that, that produce these pieces way before me. You know, I feel an obligation to respect those people and to, to try to, to keep my quality you know, close to the level that they achieved with far less advantages as far as steel tools and stuff when they were carving with shell and, and bone and nephrite and still producing phenomenal pieces of work. Eagle feathers are important to tribes all across the country in that we honor the spirit of the eagle and various, various tribes have different stories about why that's so. And, but in general, uh, you know, the eagle has interceded on our behalf with the creator and is a messenger and we honor those feathers as part of that, uh, that uh, role that that eagle played in our in in our cultural history and so the uh, you know the eagle feathers are are honored the, with the veterans in the various tribes and they're a mark of esteem and a mark of honor as a, when they're gifted either from the bird or from uh, gifted by you know, by one of the veterans to uh, to people who've earned that honor and they're used in our ceremonies we don't think of them as property because they're a sacred gift that we we don't own we're stewards of them and we know that eventually they will go to someone else and when they go on to someone else we know that that's uh, that's part of our, our cultural heritage so that they're not property in that respect Judy Goshkabas has served as Executive Director for Nebraska's Commission on Indian Affairs since 1995, where she seeks to facilitate dialogue between the state and four Native nations, the Ponca, Omaha, Santee Sioux, and Winnebago. On this morning at the National Congress of American Indians Mid-Year Conference, Judy Goshkabas, Executive Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs, welcomes honored guests and tribal leaders to the city of Lincoln. I welcome you all to the great state of Nebraska, and at this time, it is my honor to introduce Lieutenant Governor Rick Sheehy, and he is going to present some special awards for, for the Executive Committee. Lieutenant Governor. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs, and I'm uh, not appointed by the governor. I'm appointed by 14 Indian commissioners. So I work at the pleasure of those 14 tribal leaders who are appointed by the governor. And I'm beginning my 18th year as a director of the Indian Commission, and we're a non-code state agency, and my office is in the state capitol. So I'm really lucky to have uh, an office in the capitol where I have access to our unicameral one-bodied legislature. 
um, each of our tribes, the four federally recognized headquartered tribes, the Omaha, Ponca, Winnebago, and Santee, they each have two representatives on our board. And then we also have the Pawnee Nation represented. Uh, they've become ex officio members due to the fact that uh, Roger Walsh uh, gifted land to them out at Dannebrog for the purposes of the return of human remains. Our state was the first to have state legislation to protect human remains, LB 340, and that was in 1989 preceding the federal legislation. So, uh, and then most recently we added the Oglala Sioux Nation, they're ex officio, and we're getting ready to add the Iowa and the Sac and Fox. So, I feel like it's a great thing. The more tribes we have, the larger our voices, and a lot of these tribes were a part of our state, so it's only appropriate that they would be there. A lot of conflicts that arise are between municipalities and tribes, counties and tribes, states and tribes. What is your role when those types of conflicts arise? I wish it was that way. I wish it was you know, proactive, but it tends to be reactive, and you're exactly right. The challenges are more with what's happening right there. The county commissioners, for example, in Thurston County, which is where the Omaha and Winnebago reservations are. So the majority of citizens in that county and district are tribal. And so the non-Indian people um, are really threatened, especially by the uh, recent success of the Winnebago tribe. You know, they employ over 1,500 people, many non-Indians, uh, but we still have jurisdictional issues. But as you know, you have to pick your battles. Part of the benefit of me being at the Capitol is I have access. Also, I have historic knowledge. I've been there for a long time. <laughs> and so I know a lot of the senators, we have term limits now, so that's another problem. A lot of the new senators are not up to speed. So then I go meet with them and I kind of give them the backside of what's going on and I facilitate the dialogue. And I think that I put them at ease and I help them to better understand what the, all the different dynamics, how it's impacting us as Indian people, that we have dual citizenship, that they have an obligation to protect, educate our children, to provide health benefits for our people based on you know, the seeding of all the land, the treaties that you know, guaranteed this. So I think that that's helpful because the tribal leaders, they're at home dealing with so many challenges on the federal level, local level, and they can't be coming to the Capitol to do these things. So I think that's what's the benefit of having a commission. There were many great tribal leaders from Nebraska, but uh, Chief Standing Bear stands out as a, as a giant. Could you tell us his story? Um, I descend from Chief Smokemaker, one of the chiefs that was a chief a colleague of Chief Standing Bear. And back in the 1870s, to make room for the Sioux and to make life safer for the non-Indians, they needed to move us out. So they forcibly removed us, it's our trail of tears, down to Oklahoma and took us down there. It was a totally different land, red soil. We were used to beautiful black, rich rolling soil along the Niobrara River. And Standing Bear went with his family. Many died on the way. And when they arrived, many had uh, disease, malaria. His son, uh, Bear Shield, he was about 16 years old, became very ill. And he asked his father as he was dying, his dying wish was, will you take me home and bury me along the Niobrara in our homelands? So Standing Bear defied the laws. The Indians weren't allowed to leave the reservation. So he was defying the federal government. He and the others walked in the dead of winter all the way from Oklahoma up to near the Omaha Reservation. Uh, the Omaha tribe, our sister tribe, took them in. They were arrested over at Fort Omaha and then hence the trial of Standing Bear in 1879. And it was during that trial that we as Indian people finally were successful in being recognized as humans under the law. Judy served as principal consultant for a documentary on the life of Standing Bear. Native Daughters is yet another side project done in conjunction with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My friend Joe Starita, uh, his passion for Indian people transcends this story, and he's a professor at the Journalism School in Mass Communication. So he uh, worked together to submit a grant to the um, Carnegie Knight Foundation three years ago, and we were funded that. So we had our first class called Native Daughters One, and it was all about Indian women of all around the country 
different tribal women. And we did profiles on seven different women. We have a documentary coming out. It's out right now. And we're so happy that we are going to have Native Daughters 2, which will focus on Indian women of Oklahoma. So Nebraska is the heart of Indian country. And as I said earlier today, you know, a nation isn't conquered till the heart of its women lay on the ground. And we definitely are not laying on the ground. And we believe that, you know, we are strong warrior women and Standing Bear is more alive than he ever was in Walking Strong. And I'm so proud to be the director of the Indian Commission and a member of the Ponca Tribe. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation.